to the importance of God's truth found in His Word. Jesus has brought to us in His earthly ministry and then through the Holy Spirit by the apostles and prophets that wrote the New Testament. One of the things that gets missed by a lot of folks who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and will claim Him as Savior is the importance of the truth of the Bible and what it teaches regarding how we are blessed, how we are benefited when it comes to what Christ did for us we never could do for ourselves in the sinless life He lived and what He did on Calvary's cross for us that no mortal could do. And that is that there are terms of pardon. Because of Calvinism, many people think that if you do anything in order to be saved, then you're trying to earn your salvation. And they miss the point when it comes to the matter of we have to have a way of having access to all that Jesus did for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. And that is through faith in Him, which faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and is a living, active, obedient faith, James 2, which involves action or works on our part if we are to benefit from all God's done for us we never could do for ourselves. One, and a highly significant one that I fear a great many people don't understand, one of those steps in the plan of salvation, in man being saved from his sins and becoming a Christian, is repentance. Last Sunday morning, I emphasized greatly the teaching of the New Testament on baptism. And those who know the Bible and are mature in the truth know the reason you do that is because most people who believe in Christ don't think you have to be baptized to be saved. Some will say that baptism is even just a pouring of water on somebody's head or a sprinkling of water on them. Or if you are immersed in water, it's because you're already saved and it's to get into a certain church. Few who believe in Christ as Savior really teach the truth on the whole, complete plan of salvation. Now, baptism is not going to wash away one single solitary sin if you won't confess your faith in Christ. And that confession of faith in Christ, that He's the Son of God, won't do you any good if you don't, before that, repent of your sins. And all the believing you did based upon the adequate evidence and credible witnesses of the infallible Word of God that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only Savior of mankind, won't do you any good if you won't repent. When you see believers, made believers by their understanding of the truth preached to them on the day the church started in Acts 2, crying out because they were pricked in their heart by the truth and they knew it condemned them, Many brethren, what shall we do? He took them as believers in Christ and said, repent and be baptized. He didn't say as believers in Christ, without repentance, you can be immersed in water by the authority of Christ and be saved from your sins. I fear greatly that many members of the church look at baptism about the way that denominational people you look at belief. Everything that comes up was, well, I was baptized. Baptism will do only what God said baptism will do, and it will not do anything else. Baptism will not confess Christ for you. Baptism will not repent for you. Baptism will not create faith in you. Baptism will not study the Bible for you so you can have faith created in you, Romans 10, 17. And following baptism, it will not assemble, take the place of assembling, and doing in that assembly, such as we have this morning, worshiping God acceptably. It will not study the Bible for you daily. It will not pray for you. It won't take the position uh, of the place of any of those things, whether it's in the process of becoming a Christian or afterward. Baptism does just exactly what the Bible says it will do. And it won't do that if it's not preceded by hearing the Word of God in an honest heart, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in the Christ, the Son of God. Now you're a proper scriptural candidate to be baptized. Now I mentioned something about this preceding my main lesson Sunday afternoon. And there's a reason for that. Let me relate one thing to you. 
And this goes for everything I've ever done when it comes to dealing with this. Last spring, met with a young lady about performing her wedding ceremony. I didn't know anything much about her. Very pleasant person. I think I related this on a Wednesday night, sometime thereafter. And I said, take Matthew chapter 19, read verses 1 through 9, knowing that it's there to inform you and to teach you and to guide you. And will you explain to me what it teaches, as if I don't know and I need to know it? She's a good reader because I asked her to read it out loud. And she read every verse very distinctly. And I said, um, when she finished, in fact, I didn't have to say it. She made it very clear that it's God that joins together a man and a woman to be husband and wife. Then when she got to Matthew 19, verse 9, she says, well, obviously from this, that unless there's fornication in a the marriage, then God's not going to dissolve that marriage when the person innocent of fornication, that spouse, puts the person who's guilty, the spouse, away from fornication. She taught me that. I didn't tell her anything. I'd never sat down and visited her like this. I had a Bible study with her before. I said, all right, I need to ask you a question. Have you ever been married before? Yes. But you're not married now. Yes. Which means you must be divorced or he's dead. Okay. Divorced. I said, now you've told me what Jesus said that Matthew, inspired of the Holy Spirit, wrote down in the New Testament as to Matthew 19.9 regarding divorce. Was there fornication on his part? No. But you're divorced. Yes. Uh, what happened? Well, uh, he just didn't treat me right. and I didn't think he was helping me be what I needed to be. And I divorced him. Now, let's see. You're interested in what Jesus said, aren't you? Yes. You just read that to me, didn't you? Yes. You believe that to be the Word of God? Yes. And you explained to me what would dissolve a scriptural marriage, which is a Matthew 19, 6, God joined, and if you want to add to it, undefiled bed marriage from Hebrews. Yes. And what is it? Well, one must commit fornication. And the other one that's not guilty, that is spouse, puts that one away. I said, are you in that condition? No. Now, here's what I haven't told you. Across the table was her fiancé that she was planning to marry a month later. And he's listening to all of this. I said, do you think that both of you all should take this matter seriously since you admit this is the Word of God as to deciding to marry? Well, she said, I know it means that you won't be able to perform the ceremony. Now, folks... If you want to know the frustration of a gospel preacher and why he preaches, in the preaching of the word, in explaining the truth, in setting out the truth, them admitting it is the truth, explaining it to you from their own reading as well as you could, answering the questions all that puts the bee right on them, where, as Jesus did, by the way, and then coming up to that conclusion, that's all you conclude? I understand very much why Paul said, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. People can hear the truth, explain it to you, and never realize this means you in your conduct. So I said, Do you think Jesus authorizes you, since He, God, brought about marriage? Do you think, uh, for the good of man, do you think He authorizes you to marry? No. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. Because she said, I, I really need to be baptized too at some point. Well, I didn't even get into that at that point because why we met in this one. She said, well, you know, I don't make it to services too much because sometimes I'm, I'm tired after waiting bar till 3 o'clock in the morning and I just don't feel like coming. Well, you know, I don't begrudge anybody who doesn't know the truth to be into no telling what. Because the gospel is designed to pull people out of that. Everybody's a sinner. 
one extent or the other. Paul even said he was chief of sinners. How would you like to have to uh, deal with in your own mind the fact that you had persecuted the church of God, caused men to blaspheme Jesus Christ, and actually said, fine, murder Stephen. He didn't deserve to live. Paul, Paul had to do a lot of forgiving of himself, folks. Sometimes that's, that's a very hard thing to do for some folks who've gone deeply into sin. So it's not the problem. I've been working all my life to get people to come out of sin because all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But folks, where was the problem here? Her lack of belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? No. Her unwillingness to confess Christ before men as the Son of God? No. Was it her unwillingness to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of her sins? No. Where was the problem? Two things. She had not made the application of the truth to her life where she was relative to marriage. And the second thing was she understood repentance about as much as one of these little babies over here understands it. And yet she sat time and time again listening to the gospel preached, staring and intently looking. And evidently it wasn't going in here, it was going right over here. And we preachers know that happened, not right, Jeff? And Don? Any other preacher that's in here? Should I call you a preacher, Adam? Yes, sir. You better be. Every member better be a preacher and example and to the best of their ability, their knowledge and teaching of the truth. Now what do you do when somebody comes like that and says, I want to be baptized? I ask you personally, what would you do as a Christian under the authority of Jesus Christ in the New Testament to do only what he authorizes? What would you do to be faithful to him first and foremost and always? Yeah, come right on ahead and I'll baptize you. Why? Might as well go out here and drag an atheist off the street and say I'm baptizing you for the rich to sin in the name of Christ. Now we're all good for Well, I still don't believe in God. I don't believe in Christ. I don't. Well, then tell me. <laughs> Why baptize anybody that's not a scriptural candidate to be baptized? Would you encourage a non-member to partake of the Lord's Supper? Now they have to make their own mind up. But would you tell them if they ask you? Is it alright for them to partake of the Lord's Supper and God will be happy with it? No, that's why we teach the truth of the Lord's Supper. That's why we teach the truth on anything. So people can compare and contrast their minds, their own lives, to see whether they are in harmony with God. Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith or true, in, in harmony with the truth is what it's meaning. Except you be disqualified or reprobate. Disqualified. There it is in the New King James Version. Disqualified. What does it mean to be disqualified? Let's say the race. What does it mean to be disqualified? Well, you haven't met some of the rules to be able to run the race. Why is it we can understand that? But when it comes down to becoming a Christian in the steps of the plan of salvation or in the church being faithful, we don't understand about disqualification. Well, let me ask you on the day of judgment. Goats representing the lost on the left hand. I was doing that for your benefit. That's on your left hand. <laughs> on the right hand, the Lord says, are the sheep or the saved? Now, are the goats qualified or disqualified? They're disqualified. We've got uh, young babies in here. Infants almost. Little children. Are they qualified to partake of the Lord's Supper? And would you encourage them to do it? No. And you would tell me, well, they're not qualified. What does it take to be qualified? They have to be Christians. Well, would you encourage um, a two-year-old to be baptized? No. Why? They're not qualified. Everything's about qualification. Would you have somebody be baptized for the remission of sins when they have not repented of all their past sins? No, they're not qualified. Now that brings me down then to the teaching of the Bible on repentance. And I've preached on repentance a lot, taught on it. Don't know I approach it quite this way, but I am this morning because this this is something that happened right here. It won't be the last time it happens. Let me tell you something. The more people get further from God and the Bible and living their lives and getting entrenched into sin, 
And you try to go out there and do what God said do to teach them the way of righteousness, the more people you're going to see in our day and age who are unwilling to repent. Unwilling to repent. That means I have to ask, what is it for me, David Brown, to repent? Well, first of all, in Luke 13, 3, Jesus in his earthly ministry speaking to the Jews, except ye repent. Ye shall all likewise perish. Do you know the force in the English language right here, which is a proper translation of the Greek, of accept? You know the force of an acceptive clause? Let me read it again. Accept ye repent. You know what that means? If and only if you repent. If and only if you repent. Can you escape perishing? That's significant. Keep that in mind any time you come across it. Except you repent. It's another way of saying you must repent. No use thinking about anything else if you're to the point of repentance until you repent. You've got to do it. It's imperative. You can't get around it. You must repent. If you don't, what's going to happen to you? You're going to perish. Now who said that? Jesus did. Now, he also said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Obviously, belief and repentance was necessary on their part, or they're going to die in their sins, and that implies you're losing your soul. Brethren, everything we do on this earth as Christians has to do with saving souls. I wish we'd understand that. Yes, the church is a social institution, but its primary function here is to carry out God's will in saving souls. You're either trying to get the gospel, the power of God to save, Romans 1.16, to people who have never heard it and teaching it accurately, or you're trying to keep those who've heard it, believed it, and from the heart obeyed it, and are now Christians, faithful. Either way you go, you're trying to save souls from a devil's hell. Most people who ever lived on this earth and are accountable to God are going to go to hell. Now, I know that's so politically incorrect, even in the church today. But it's the truth. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Because wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leads where? <laughs> the torment. It's easy. All you have to do to go to hell is nothing. Just do as you please, and you're going to be there. But straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, means a narrow hemmed in passage in the case of serving God. Narrow hemmed in by the commandments of God, and you can't just jump down it nonchalantly and get to heaven. That's the meaning of the word, the old S-T-R-A-I-T, which we don't use today. We just use S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, straight line, for all of it. But in those days, that's what straight. I'm in a straight betwixt the two. Well, today we have one word for that. But even in English, when the King James Version was translated, they had another word to mean it's hard. It's a difficult thing. Well, when your mind's made up to from the heart serve God no matter what He asks, because everything He asks of you is to get you to heaven, then that straight way is not quite the same. But when you're still wanting this, this life, the old saying goes, your cake and eat it too. You want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and still go to heaven, it won't work. You've got to get that out of you. You've got to want to do right. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. That person will be filled. So, we have then the command. After you leave, Jesus' work with the Jews in Acts 17.30. Paul on Mars Hill told them plainly. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere. Are you left out? Commandeth all men everywhere to repent. But I must ask the question, and I want to drive it home now, what is repentance? And here's what most people think, the meaning of the word repent. I tell somebody, buddy, you must repent. David Brown, you must repent. Whoever out there, all of you, you must repent. You know what a lot of people think? In fact, most people think. Well, I look at all those sins in my life. I sure am sorry for them. They pick right on up. Ask God for forgiveness. They never change a thing. I'm just sorry. That's not repentance. Never has been repentance. 
A person that repents, is he sorry for his sin? Well, of course he's sorry for his sins, but that's not all. It involves the will of a person. When he knows the truth, he looks at his life, he looks at the way he's been living all his life, he sees things in his life that are contrary to the truth. But he wants to serve Jesus. He wants to be a Christian. He wants forgiveness of sins. He wants to live the rest of his life doing what God said. But he sees all this back here. What's he going to do? He's got to change his life. And that means will turning from an habitual purpose life of sin. Now what makes me do that godly sorrow? When I am so sorry toward God for my transgression of his law. And that's sin, 1 John 3, 4. So sorry that it just eats me up. And it brings me to the point that says, I'm not going to do those things anymore. And I want to start doing what my Lord authorizes me to do the rest of my life. That's repentance. It's when you stop the practice of sin. Whether it's one sin or 40 sins. Of course you're sorry for them. The gospel made you aware of the fact you're a sinner and lost by them. But it's more than that. You want to come out of that mindset. You want to change your life. See, that's, that's how you're convicted of your sinful condition and you're, by the process of conversion, converted, changed to life. And it's not done without your will. And folks, our will is the most dangerous part of our heart. Because everything we do, we will to do it. Or everything we don't do, we will to do it. Or we try, if that's what we're going to do. But that's because God gave us that power to do it. And when people put themselves into positions that are contrary to God's will in anything, and they want to be forgiven, they've got to stop it. Somebody says, oh, I just want to be saved, but i got so many sins. Well, repent. You know what you might as well say? Stop it. That's exactly what repentance is. You start doing what you ought to be doing that you haven't been doing, and you cease doing what you shouldn't do, and your life is geared to that the rest of your life. And all of it's determined by the will of Jesus Christ. Go back and look at that song we just sung. Brett didn't know you were going to sing it, or I'd work that in here. I hadn't even thought about it, and I sat there and listened. I said, everything about this goes with my sermon. Break thou the bread of life. What are you saying? I will to know the truth. Open it to me. I want to know it. You even got a couple of stanzas in there about truth. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord. Bless it to me. What do you mean? Make me to appreciate what it is and to change my life by my will to submit to it and pursue it all the days of my life. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. The truth will make you free. What good is it to know that, John 8, 31 and 32, and not do what you have to do that the truth requires? That's the reason I have preached for a long time. A whole lot easier to get people to understand the New Testament teaching on baptism and scriptural baptism than it is to get them to fully understand what it means for them to repent. And you get people in the church. And they play with sin. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a work in progress. You know what that means? I'm a work in progress. I just want to vomit and please give me direction, buddy. Uh, a work in, You know what you're doing to yourself psychologically? Making it easy to keep on committing it and just telling you, you know, I can't really be, but I'm a work in progress. God understands. Yeah, he understands. He understands exactly you're not wanting to do his will and you're enjoying the mess you're in. Now, there's a proper way you can use the work in progress, but I watch people and I get the definition they give to it. How I do it? By their fruit you shall know them. That's how I know what they mean by that. So it takes will on anything having to do with going to heaven. He that willeth to do the Father's will, Jesus said, he shall know the teaching. Well, what if you don't will to do the Father's will? You're not going to know the teaching. Because you won't do what's necessary to learn it. And so it is that you can preach your heart out and if Jesus was here or Paul was here and people will sort of stare at the wall and come out the door and say, oh, that's a fine sermon preacher. If you want to know a lot of times with some people what goes right over my head, is compliments like that when I watch them continue to live a life of sin and though they hear it preached every day in the world is what they need to do and they just will not do it. 
Consider Acts eleven eighteen. Acts eleven eighteen. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now that was said regarding the Jews realizing the Gentiles had to write the gospel as much as they did, and the comment about the matter of the household of Cornelius. But notice, he's granted it. It is granted to them, but it's still something they must do. You know, God could have said, you can repent all day long. Make me different. You've already sinned. It's too bad. If it's a pure law system, that's the way it would be. You could repent all day long. It wouldn't change anything if it was a pure law system. Because you violated the law, what should you get? Exactly what you deserve. No mercy, no favor, nothing. But God said, well, it's going to be different from the law of Moses. The whole gospel's here, and everybody has a right now to be saved. So they were thankful, these Jewish Christians, that God allows the Gentile, the non-Jew, to be saved. In Luke 15, 7, Jesus says, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. One who's rejoicing in heaven. Why, it's God. Why wouldn't he rejoice? He made us, our spirits are in his image. He sent his son to die for us and go through that ordeal. Wouldn't he rejoice that we receive with meekness and grafted word which is able to save our souls? But listen to this, Luke 16, 27 through 30. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, this is the rich man in torment, that thou wouldst send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Well, Abraham's in on this. He says, unto him they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Of course, Abraham says, they won't hear most of the prophets, neither will they hear one of you rose from the dead. Of course, Jesus is telling this. How many people running over themselves after he rose from the dead to obey the gospel? Now, the point is, though, the man even in hell realized <laughs> that those five brethren, to keep from coming to where he was, had to repent. Here's a confession from a lost man saying they still are in the place of where he can do some good. Doesn't do me any good. I, I, I want to do what I can. But he shows lack of respect for the authority of God's word by saying it's insufficient to get them to repent. Send somebody from the dead. Lazarus, in fact. So they will. The point being here, he knew they had to repent. He just didn't believe the word of God was enough to do it. But he did recognize the need to repentance. What is repentance? I say again, godly sorrow works repentance, 2 Corinthians 17. I say again, it's not the reforming of one's life. It's what takes place to make the reformation in your life happen. It's the will to turn from the practice life of sin to turn to doing God's will. And therefore, you reform your life. Repentance precedes reformation, but it comes after godly sorrow. When people want to remain in a condition that's sinful and be baptized, and then they want to come up out of the water remaining in that same sinful condition, there has been no repentance, at least on that point. In Matthew 21, 28 through 29, you have a good uh, example of repentance. But what think ye, Jesus asked? Certain man had two sons. And he came to the first. You see, kids haven't changed a whole lot. And said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he repented and went. Notice he said, I will not to the Father's command. But afterwards, he repented and went. Which meant... His change of mind says, I will do what I said I wouldn't do. But the will's there. You can't put any good thing into practice in your mind or your life that you don't will to. You won't do any sin that you don't will to. Do you remember Flip Wilson been dead for several years, a black comedian? Remember him? Tickled me to death watching him. You remember him? He would put on a little show and he'd say, the devil made me do it. And he'd usually have... Somebody betrayed like a woman and she went down and bought this dress 
and her husband's getting all over for buying it. And he, well, the devil made me do it. And then she goes through all these details. It's just hilarious. He does. Of showing how the devil got to do it. And he carries on this conversation. Brethren, I thought, you know, my brethren wouldn't come out and say all those things. But they imply that's the way they operate. Well, after all, your work's still in progress. Isn't it amazing how we tell lies to ourselves and believe it? So we can keep on doing what we like, though we know the Bible condemns it. One great example is, is how many people, all my life as a preacher, and I know it's gone on and continues to go on, find people trying to justify themselves and not attending the services and still be all right. I visited an elderly lady in my first full-time work nearly 50 years ago. At that time, she was way up in her 70s. And she hadn't been for a while, and she had been coming. And so I went by to see her. Very In those days, you know, at my age, people like that was grandmother. That's basic. And that's the way I approached them. I said, I'm with her in bids in a second. I said, you know, we've been missing you in the assemblies. And she, him, hauled around, and I frankly don't remember everything she said because she never did really want to address the subject. And finally she said, well, you know, I partake of the sacraments. Uh, you know, let's go back and start at the beginning. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book. That's what you feel like. Been sitting all these years, old enough, my grandma. I said, I'll take the sacrament. There's no such thing in New Testament Christianity known as sacraments. Well, she meant the Lord's Supper. Well, I'll partake of the sacrament. And you almost feel that way all the time with brethren. And you've been around them forever. And uh, you come up sometime where they are. And there's somebody there outside the church they know that's a friend or some partner. And they'll say, oh, let me introduce you to my pastor. B-I-B-L-E. And it never gets any better than that. You know why? They don't want to. It just comes down to that. I wish, I wish people would be honest and just say, I, look, I know I'm supposed to be there. I know what the Bible says. Don't waste your time with me. I didn't want to come. I don't think I've ever had that said to me. I, I didn't want to come. One time the elders and me were visiting a couple that had been quite faithful, but he just start, started just missing. So I went out and uh, visited with him one night. This was years ago. And he started coming up, and I can't remember all the excuses we'd bring it up. So I just, I just nudged one of the elders and I said, what's this? Every excuse he made, I just answered this way. He'd say, well, this, this, this. I said, well, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things be added to you. And then you come up with something else. I say, okay, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things be added unto you. That went on for about three or four excuses he made. You know, you never can stop saying that when people come up with excuses. And you'll be right every time. Because they have convinced themselves they can do wrong. And because they have done something right. And they're not atheists. They still believe in Christ. They will confess the Bible's teaching on the church. But in their mind, the devil sold them the bill of goods that, well, because of all of that, I've got to pass. Now, now and if, if I want to do something, whatever. And that's what it means by deceiving yourself and believing a lie. You see then that Paul is dealing with this when he writes to the church of Corinth and all the mess they had going on. You're talking about needing a godly sorrow and that worked repentance, and that's where it's taught in 1 Corinthians. That's where it's specifically said. But look what he says about them. You'll understand repentance and the lesson's yours. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6. These folks have already heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. They're members of the church, the Christians. Keep that in mind. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He's not talking about those outside the church. They knew that. They would confess that. They knew the Gentile culture they'd come out of at Corinth. They knew Corinth had a reputation throughout the whole Roman Empire as one of the worst places in the world. That if you wanted to really slide a Roman citizen or anybody in the Mediterranean world, just call them a Corinthian. Just say they were Corinthianized. That was a humiliating statement in that day and time. Be not deceived. Oh, be not deceived. How many times does the Bible say that? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now look here. 
and such were, used to be past tense, not anymore, not present tense, such were, not all, but some of you. But, but, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I've actually had, and I engaged in a debate in Fort Smith, Arkansas, to where the gospel preacher, I'll put that in quotes, was teaching that if you engage in any or all of these things, then you come up and you're just baptized. Everything's all right. Well, what do you leave out, folks? Is baptism the only step in the plan of salvation? He left out repentance. You see me do this, I think. Over here is a column. And it lists all of these, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, and so on. There's another column right next to it. And at the top of it, you put, why are these things? It's because they practice or do these things. And then you can draw the middle baptism because that's where people are focusing, you know. And then on the other side, the next column after baptism is that they continue to be fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, etc. And then the last column, the second one after baptism, you ask, why? It's because they're still doing these things. And then I went over to Romans 6, verse 1, and looked at, the, looked at him and said, John, Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I said, that's where Johnny parts with Paul. Paul said, God forbid. Johnny says, all right. You take which one you want to follow and meet Jesus' the judgment on. Continue means to stay in a state uninterrupted. If a man is committing fornication, if he's called a fornicator because he commits fornication, he's baptized, he's continuing to commit fornication, pray tell what is he? The only difference from before baptism had, he's now a wet fornicator. There's been no repentance, brethren. If you're over here in an adulterous union, it means it's a marriage not sanctioned by God. God did not join you as husband and wife. You're in an adulterous union. Why? Because you're living in what the Bible calls adultery. You're baptized. You're still living in adultery. What? Pray tell what you call him. A wet adulterer. Now is he going to heaven? All because people don't know re that repentance is far, 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 far more than saying, well, I'm sorry. And then somebody does this. Yeah, but, but, but they committed that fornication or they stole that car 30 years ago. Do you mean to tell me there's a statute of limitation in God's mind on sin? Does that mean that if I can be righteous the very moment God's come, though I've been, been worse than Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini all hooked together before that time, I'll be all right because, you see, that's in the past. I did those things years ago. You know, even, even the, the world knows better than that because up until recently, they hunted Nazis all over the place years after, after the war and they brought them and, and put them on trial. Can you just see that Nazi saying, well, first of all, as was said at Nuremberg, we were just doing what our country said, and we were responsible for that law. You're under another law, and you're trying to judge us by your law. Well, that was answered. There's a higher law that governs all civil law. But then he says, but that was 50 years ago. So, I'm not held responsible for my actions 50 years ago? Let me ask you something on the death of judgment. Try that on the Lord. That was 50 years before I died. That was 50 years before you came back that I was a fornicator or a thief or covetous. So I haven't been that way for 50 years. Well, did you believe in from the heart obey the gospel to gain remission? No, but I stopped that a long time ago. And what's the Lord going to say to you? Depart from me. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. Brethren, if we don't in the church today realize that more and more people are getting far, far away from God and the Bible, we can't depend upon them having a basic understanding, even though it's corrupted by denominational viewpoints. They don't know anything. They're getting into all sorts of immoral practices. They're getting used to them. And then something wakes up and they say, well, I want to serve God. Well, fine. But then the rich young ruler comes along. 
The rich young ruler said, took time to come and find Jesus. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Folks, I'd love just to get most people get to that stage, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love to have people come up to you on the street and say, Preacher, I know you, I've heard of you. Would you tell me what to do to be saved my sins? Well, we'd you know, probably go to me to make it right then. It'd jar us so much. Well, the Lord, being there all approaching God while he's in his earthly ministry under the authority of the law of Moses, tells him what to do. He says, These have I done from my youth up. What lack I yet? Well, the Lord hit him right where he knew the problem was. The man loved his riches. Go and sell all you got and give to the poor and come and follow me. What do men do? Were those, were those qualifying points that he had to meet? Yes. He disqualified himself. Why? Because he loved his riches more than he loved Christ. You might as well get ready for a lot of that. You might as well get ready for a lot of it. More than we've ever seen. More radical than we've ever seen. And that's the reason anybody just trots down this aisle and says, I want to be baptized. Assume nothing about their understanding of the complete plan of salvation and what it means in their mind and their life and their adjustment. They're going to have to be talked to if they haven't been talked to. And you can see in my example that I began with, you can even sit down and talk to them and have them explain to you the scriptures and they can explain it right. But they don't get it. They don't apply it. And that's much like the lost rich man. There he is in torment because he didn't respect the authority of God and wouldn't obey the gospel. And he's still lifting up his eyes in torment after he's begged Abraham to send Lazarus over with his finger dipped in water and touched it to my tongue for I'm tormenting this flame. He still says, well, they won't listen to the law of Moses back there. They need some special help. Send one back from the dead and they will believe because he knew they needed to repent. But he didn't believe the Bible was able to do what God said it would do. So he just expect that. People are justifying themselves. Now, this morning, if you want to become a Christian, that's exactly what God wants. That's why Christ died. That's why I'm preaching. That's why this church exists. We are the instrument through which the gospel has gotten to the world. Each one of us are expected to reach people with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of salvation. But you must believe in Jesus Christ based on the evidence of His Word. It's the only source of proper belief, Romans 10, 17. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. Confess your faith in the Christ, Romans 10.10. 10. Now you're qualified by God, not just me. I can only preach His gospel. It's not my gospel. It didn't originate with man what I preach. Now you're qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you'll be saved by God because it's God that says you're saved, your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. But try to be baptized without repentance and see if he'll say that to you. But let me back up. Somebody may try it. No, don't try it because I know what's going to happen to the judgment. If you do that, having not repented, your sins are all going to be still held against you. And for a member of the church to have gone back and done something wrong or just apostatized completely and refuses to repent, well, I'm sorry, but they never adjust their lives. There's never any difference in them after they said they're sorry. They have repented. But you must, if you want to enjoy God's second law of pardon, you must then confess your faith or confess your sins after you repented and pray God for forgiveness. That's his second law of pardon. But repentance is involved in all of it. And now you know what repentance is if you didn't already know. And now you know why some people cannot be baptized scripturally. It's because they will not repent. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sit.